Voilà, bonjour, merci d'être présent. Bonjour à tous. Nous sommes déjà plusieurs qui sommes connectés. La langue principale va être l'anglais et vous avez la traduction. Donc, Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for attending this session on Sahel, a land of opportunity. This is organized uh, within the UN hub in Dubai Expo. And we are really thankful for their support. You are connected from many places in Sahel at least the seven countries involved in operation, but also from other places. So welcome to you all. My name is Benoit Thierry. I'm the West Africa Hub Director for IFAD, which is the office uh, taking care of Sahel countries based in Dhaka. As panelists today, we will have colleagues from WFP, from FAO, from IFAD, all institutions working together on this Sahel program called SD3C. So I would like to welcome my colleague uh, Pate Sen. He's based in uh, Abidjan, working on environment and climate change. And he will talk in the last part of his webinar about the Great Green Wall. Pate, can you hear us? Yes, thank you very much for your introduction and good morning and good afternoon, colleagues. Then I'd like to introduce you from uh, FAO, Mr. Adin, who is based in Dakar from the regional office. Adin, are you here? Yes, thank you so much, uh, Benoit, and uh, good morning, everyone. And we finally have colleagues uh, from WFP who are both Mr. Thomas Conan and Mr. Idrissa in Niger. Can you hear us? I can hear you very well. Hi, how are you doing? Good. Oui, and we see you as well. Aussi. Thank you. So now that we are all together and uh, welcome also to the participants who are in the room. I would like to invite the resident coordinator of the United Nations system in the UAU, Ms. Ms. Dr. Dena Asaf. She will give the welcome remarks and an introductory speech to the event. So Dr. Asaf, you are very much welcome. I hope you can use this one. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Should I use this uh, mic? Yeah. Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to first. Uh, oh, where are you? Thank you for. Uh, uh, coming to the UN Hub, uh, uh, Mr. Bernard Twery, the director of the IFAD West Africa Hub, uh, colleagues online and in the room from FAO, WFP, IFAD, and other UN entities, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the United Nations Hub at Expo 2020 Dubai, and welcome to this panel discussion orga organized within the Food, Agriculture, and Livelihoods uh, theme week within Expo discussing the challenges and opportunities of the Sahel. The word Sahel means the shore in Arabic. It refers to a vast 6,000 kilometers area, 6, kilometers area transversing 12 African states from the Sudan to Mauritania, covering multiple agroecological systems from the savanna to deserts to grasslands and steppes. It is a unique part of the world in many ways, not only in terms of ecological richness and habitat diversity, but also in the way it experiences climate change and deals with it. 
Climate change threatens to further degrade land, vegetation, water resources, and food systems through, increase in, through the increase of drought, desertification, and floods, and projected shortening of the rainy season. The Sahel Ecological Zone has shifted from 50 to 200 kilometers southward over the last three decades, resulting in biodiversity and arable land losses. The situation in the Lake Chad region uh, is just one example on the harsh realities faced by over 400 million persons across the Sahel, slow, slowing down food production systems, reversing hard-won development gains uh, of many. Despite the challenges, we are here today to discuss the opportunities. As you will hear from colleagues shortly, innovation, solidarity, and, and in, in, uh, indigenous and genius local solutions to these challenges show significant promise. Thanks to the abundant human, cultural, and natural resources in the region, and we are grateful for our colleagues who have come from West Africa to share their experiences and insights with all of us here at Expo. IFAD alone has 27 ongoing projects amounting to 2 billion US dollars in investments across 10 countries, a portfolio supported by innovative green financing from Green Climate Fund. IFAD efforts towards green financing serves the Great Great Green Great Wall, DGW, with a tongue twister, initiative, and works to strengthen the resilience of small-scale farmers and producers to mitigate the impacts of climate change. However, this is only the start as we continue to deal with the profound impacts of climate change around the world. This will require new and additional financing, technical collaborations and experience sharing, as well as stronger international solidarity that leaves no one behind in the face of climate change. I wish you a good and stimulating panel discussion and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Asaf. Very nice of you and uh, thank you for the UN support to this event. Uh, I just want to give you this uh, brochure about the program. Wonderful, thank you, you so much. We appreciate it. And just to say very informally, it's great to have Ifat here and the colleagues also online. Even if you're online, you're here with us in spirit. Hope that some of you can come still to Expo. You have a month. But here the UN Hub has provided us an opportunity to make sure that the United Nations is able to bring to this wide audience and through the networks of Expo, because this, is, this event is also publicized across Expo uh, of the work of the United Nations. So thank you for coming today. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Okay, we have now many colleagues uh, joining us. Uh, we are going to see now a video on Sahel and this program. And I think our colleague from Dakar will now show the video full screen. Rama, over to you. Hello everyone, then I will share my screen now for you to, to show you the, the, the video, which is, uh, which is here. Okay. Rama, we just see part of it. Although for many centuries, okay. the Sahel Tell me, uh, Benoit, you can't see it perfectly? No, we just see a very limited... Uh, we don't see... Well, ...has been screen. rich in natural in resources, way, culture, and had a youthful population. In the last decades, its people have been suffering from the consequences of climate change and insecurity. Now. The Joint Sahel Programme, SD3C, a response to the challenges of COVID-19, conflicts and climate change, contributes equally to the resilience and human development axis of the G5 Sahel strategy and the resilience pillar of UNIS, the United Nations Integrated Strategy for the Sahel. Senegal is joining forces with the G5 Sahel countries, 
Burkina Faso, Mali, Mauritania, Niger and Chad in the SD3C Regional Programme. The three UN Rome-based agencies, the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, EPFAD, and the World Food Programme, WFP, jointly designed SD3C as the first ever Rome-based agency's region-wide programme. All three are also involved in SD3C's funding and implementation. SD3C aims to improve the livelihoods of small-scale agricultural producers, particularly women and youth living in cross-border areas of the region. The target group is composed of approximately 123,000 rural households, and this is nearly a million beneficiaries, of which 50% are women and 40% are young people. Over the next six years, SD3C is expected to invest over 180 million US dollars to improve production in agricultural and pastoral areas and boost cross-border activities by facilitating markets and value chains widely spread in the ECOS area. The program strategy is to swiftly overcome obstacles to development and peace using scaled up local solutions such as community conflict management, land restoration and vegetable production that have been successfully applied in the Sahel by FAO, EPFAD, WFP and their partners. SD3C aims to reduce poverty in the project areas by 20% with the hope of contributing to a peaceful and prosperous Sahel. Thank you, Benoit. I think that the video is finished now. I Very let good. you the, the floor. Thank you. Thank you. These are the beauties of uh, not only virtual, but hybrid events. So we look from one version as well here. Good. So as you can see, all the dear friends, that uh, in these videos, we show how several UN agencies are working together. We call them the Rome-based agencies, sister agencies leading on agriculture, on food aspect, and they are FAO, IFAD, and WFP. So I will now ask Mr. Adin, who was presented earlier, as a FAO officer in the regional office of Dakar, how did you see the advantage and the respective role of each of the agencies when you were preparing this project in design or implementation. So what was the respective role of each of the agency and what was the comparative advantage in this program, be it technical, financial, or operational? Ada, over to you. So thank you so much, Benoit, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, let me first, uh, extend my warm greeting to the UN President Coordinator uh, and Dubai Expo participant on behalf of the FAO Coordinator for West Africa, uh, Dr. Robert Gay. As you know, the RBAs have a long traditional relationship uh, that has progressed in recent years in several thematic areas that includes nutrition, gender and resilience. I think uh, this collaboration is especially busy on the sharing of techni technical knowledge first, but also lesson learning and good practices at all levels. So uh, regarding your question in terms of collaboration within the framework of the SD3C G5 side plus Senegal program, first of all, uh, a steering committee shared by the executive secretary of the G5 Sahel has been established, as well as a regional unit in charge of the coordination 
fairness and monitoring evaluation. At country level, institutional management is sharing with IFAT different program projects that we call project OATS, which definitively ensure program coordination and management. FAO, like WFP, is an implementing agency and therefore provide technical expertise and implementation support as well. IFAD provides funding, but also coordination support. It's important to mention here that uh, we developed together a joint strategy for mobilizing additional resources to support the implementation of this program. It's also planning to jointly conduct monitoring, evaluation, and communication for the program in accordance with the monitoring, evaluation, and communication manual developed in a COVID by the three agencies and together with G5 Science Secretariat. So in terms of comparative advantage, in addition to the food security information and early warning tools developed by FAO, I want to mention here the food security information network that we develop. Also the integrated food system phase classification and the global information and yearly warning system on food and agriculture that we develop. We are already carrying out in Sahel several humanitarian actions aiming at restoring and strengthening the livelihood of vulnerable population in the region. For example, from 2018 to 2021, more than 5 million vulnerable people have been assisted in the region in various ways. More than 40,000 animals and 30,000 tons of animal feed have been distributed, including within nutritional blocks, as you know. And also more than Three million animals have been vaccinated, and at least 32,000 veterinary kits have been distributed among the region. And finally, more than 5,000 tons of climate resilient seeds have been distributed, and tens of thousands of agricultural kits have been provided to the most vulnerable people. In addition to these, we have implemented on the ground forest and landscape restoration technology developed by FAO, which transform degraded lands into health and fertile landscape where local communities, ecosystem, and other stakeholders can coexist within the framework of sustainable land management. So in conclusion, I would like to state here that this program is well aligned with the new FAO strategic framework, especially on three of the four barriers. The first is the better production by ensuring sustainable consumption and production mode. The second is the better environment by protecting, restoring, and promoting sustainable use of continental ecosystem and combat climate change. And the last but not the least is a better life by promoting inclusive economic growth while reducing gender inequality. Thank you so much and over to you, Benoit. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Adam, for the FAO office. And FAO is indeed the most historical agency in Rome, having been created at the late years 40s, then came IFAD in 77 and WFP in 92. So now I will turn to IFAD and ask Mr. Pate Sen the same question. So Pate, can you tell us how concretely was that work with the other agencies? And what is the added value of IFAD in this Sahel program? Over to you, Pate. Thank you very much, Bonoa, and thanks, colleagues, for uh, joining us. So, as you know, <clears throat> the Sahel is a quite uh, 
uh, interesting area in the world, but at the same time, a land of opportunities. And uh, many challenges, multidimensional challenges, and uh, the scale of the intensity of those issues uh, cannot be addressed as what, uh, just alone. It has to be cross-border, but also jointly. So as you know, the climate change is also a major risk multiplier in the Sahel. And the projections are giving, uh, from an agricultural perspective, uh, some reduction of crops yield by 10 to 20% by 2020, and more drier condition in the Sahel. So overcoming these interconnecting and complex challenges requires sustained and collective responses among us, among most of our agencies. What we have done in terms of agencies and from IFAD perspective, which is the lead investor on smallholder farmers, is to combine effort uh, with FAO, with WFP and other agencies, including the Africa Risk Capacity and F the African Development Bank to come with more resources and address these uh, multidimensional challenges, both from a climate, from a resilience perspective, from also inclusion perspective, youth, gender, uh, but also from a nutrition point of view. So we've been working on joint programs with uh, our sister agencies, WFP and also FAWO under the SD3C umbrella, and also going to tap into the, the different funding sources uh, out, outside our organization. The biggest fund which we are accredited and also uh, well known now is the Green Climate Fund. And we've been there as one. And let me share a story where we were trying to all uh, mobilize resources from that fund in, uh, when we were all accredited in 2018. So we sent several projects, WFP, ourselves, and other agencies, Africa Risk Capacity also working with other partners. And we were asked if you want to be very impactful and if you want to get resources quickly, work together. So in Mali, we join our hands and forces and we come up with what we call the Africa Integrated Climate Risk Management Program, which brings all these agencies together and where we are looking at risk from a different perspective, but in a very coordinated manner. From a technical point of view, some agencies will be in charge of risk preparedness when climate risk is not yet there. What are we going to do with the climate information system and the infrastructure to be in place to provide information to when to sow, when to harvest, those very simple information needed by a farmer. And second, when the risk is there, how do you adapt? So we have what we call in IFA, the Adaptation for Smallholder Agriculture Program, the largest one, which provides a set and a battery of adaptation techniques from the climate resiliency to the drip irrigation, to um, a, a warehouse with a climate resilient uh, features, including also roads, climate proof road, all those kind of activities and intervention which you can put to build the resilience. And last, in terms of this integrated risk management, if there is a big shock, what do we do? How do we transfer it to the market and at least get paid again and not lose everything? The loss and damage has been integrated in a system where by a national insurance company and international insurance company like Africa Risk Capacity can work together. So this program has been funded by the GCF for $143 million and now under starting under the SG3C. Another one which is coming soon is on green banking, whereby most of these smallholder farmers in MSMEs or in cooperative or in a farmer's organization uh, struggle to have credit to do their business. So our work with other agencies, AFPB and, uh, and also FAO and the others, which we will bring in from a technical point of view, will be first to go and leverage resources cheap from the market, from the GCF at 0% interest rate and blend it with those partners' resources so at least we can provide it to um, our farmers' organization. This has been also currently 
uh, uh, recommended for approval. And we are coming with other set for $250 million. And uh, we are working on scaling up all these programs across the Sahel up to Djibouti, across the Green Grid World. So overall, our work is leveraging resources, but also bringing technical expertise, particularly on the area of adaptation, where we are very strong and uh, working also with in, a, in an integrated manner and each agency can bring one value addition. I'll stop there, Benoit, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Pate, for this overview. So you can see all that uh, generally among our three agencies, FAO is really the, the mind, the thinking head. IFAD is more of a financing arm. And then we are now going to hear about WFP, who is the active arm in the field. So I am calling on Mr. Thomas Conan, who is a senior regional program advisor. Thomas, same question for you. How did it concretely translate that common work on Sahel? And what is your added value in the program? Over to you. Thank you, dear Benoit, um, dear resident coordinator, UNCP and colleagues from the UN Hub. Allow me first to, to comment uh, IFAD for bringing us together um, on this important event today uh, to be at the starting point actually of the SVC working together with the G5 Sahel to serve the six Sahelian countries. Uh, the regional challenges exacerbated by climate change demand unprecedented investments in land rehabilitation but also in education, health and nutrition, green job for all, enabling social cohesion and better governance. Compounded effects of COVID-19, conflict and drought, increase food insecurity in West Africa. The region is actually facing the highest number of food insecure uh, people since the launch of the Kala Monizé, the equivalent of the ITC uh, in 2014. In the upcoming lean season, we have 38 million people projected to be food insecure, which is an increase of 23% compared to last year. As rome based agencies, our three agencies have a long-term relationship serving population for their eradication of hunger, ensure food security and sustainable agriculture and food system. The three sisters agencies are jointly partnering with the G5 Sahel Permanent Secretary for joint resilience action in the Sahel. Now, to answer your question specifically, the rome based agencies complement each other to restore resilience productive capital, to improve economic opportunities and livelihood in rural communities that we jointly target. This collaboration ensure coherence and strengthen effectiveness. To successfully implement the SDC, WFP brings its expertise from the Sahel Resilience Initiative. Since 2018, WFP and communities have indeed together rehabilitated more than 100,000 hectares of degraded land in the G5 Sahel countries. In the past year alone, the program has reached more than 2.5 million people, reducing vulnerabilities and building resilience to shock. Restoring landscape and engaging in the wider community goes far beyond food and nutrition security. It has the potential to ease conflict. Sustainable land and natural resource management is at the center of WFP integrated resilience approach, working to combat land degradation, restore ecosystem, and enable sustainable access to water. In practice, this means bringing degraded land back to life, enabling access to food and healthy diets, getting children back to school, developing value chains to boost incomes and green jobs. WFP brings this experience to the SD3C but also a partnership with authorities and communities, or operational footprint and assets close to the most affected communities. By 2023, and as per the expected target, WFP intends to support more than 100,000 people, or around 30,000 households, using that nexus approach. To prevent conflict, we bring people together to restore land, build community productive assets, and enhance social cohesion which is a major requirement to easing conflict in the region, obviously. Resilience building activities serve as a buffer to instability by strengthening solidarity between people, strengthening social safety net, keeping land productive, and offering op economic opportunities, which is conducive to peaceful cohabitation. To adapt to climate change, 
many communities have abundant knowledge of the environment and the natural resources they rely on, obviously. Such knowledge allows crop and trees to grow even with little or erratic rainfall. This enables solutions rooted in food production, such as agriculture, animal husbandry, or fisheries, can go a long way in reducing malnutrition, increasing diet diversity, and improving nutrition. Finally, in some countries such as Niger and Chad, WFP will leverage the SSPC by bringing additional activities from an integrated residence package, such as school feeding and nutrition sensitive intervention, to provide a fully comprehensive package. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for this good presentation on WFP. And now that we have seen the three agencies involved in uh, SD3C, I would like to insist and detail with you that in this crisis we are having in Sahel, many places are devastated, especially in the north, and government services are not ensured anymore. So that's why this program is working a lot, not only for farmers, but also with farmers. So I'm now going to call on the farmer organization and livestock organization who are represented in our program. They are in the field working hard. And I think we have in line Mr. Najiru Sal and Mr. Blama as well. So who will start to talk first? Blama, are you with us? Alors, Monsieur Najirou et Blama, euh, si vous, vous êtes entendez très nous. bien, et c'est notre administrateur, Monsieur Najirou Sal, qui va prendre la parole en premier. Très bien. So we thank you very much because, as you can see, we have. Bonjour, bonjour tout le monde. English. Najirou, à bonjour. Toi, je vais prendre la parole. Bonjour, je suis Nazir Roussal, je suis le secrétaire général d'Europa, mais ici je représente l'ensemble des trois réseaux. Je suis venu porter la parole effectivement des organisations euh, agro-sylvopastalétiques de la zone du Sahel. Sur la première question, oui, est-ce qu'on m'entend Oui, on t'entend, mais on ne te voit pas. Si tu Bonjour, je voudrais un retour, est-ce qu'on m'entend Oui, on t'entend, mais on ne voit pas ta caméra. Est-ce qu'on m'entend Bonjour. Bonjour. Oui, on vous entend. On vous demande la caméra. Ok, merci. Très bien, merci. Je peux continuer Allez-y, on vous écoute. Est-ce que je peux continuer Oui, tu peux continuer. Oui, on vous écoute. Ok. Du point de vue des organisations que nous sommes, là, nous avons comme finalité d'appuyer nos membres pour qu'ils soient d'une manière plus digne dans leur zone. Particulièrement pour la zone du Sahel, je ne vais pas revenir sur ce qui a été décrit, mais particulièrement quel est le rôle qu'on peut attendre des organisations. En premier lieu, on peut s'interroger sur nos propres responsabilités. Nous sommes qui Nous sommes des éleveurs, nous sommes des pasteurs, nous sommes des gens des forêts, nous sommes des agriculteurs qui vivent en milieu rural dans cette zone pasteur, dans cette zone du Sahel. La première responsabilité, le premier rôle qu'on pourrait jouer en fonction de notre responsabilité, c'est de pouvoir se parler entre nous, s'entendre entre nous, agir ensemble entre nous. C'est une des fonctions que les, nos trois organisations sont en train de jouer par le biais des dispositifs existants. La deuxième notion, c'est de dire, écoutez, sur quoi on pourrait partager, sur quoi on pourrait connaître. Nous cherchons à mieux connaître nos vies en passant par une information collectée, traitée et diffusée autour de ce qui se passe autour de nos exploitations familiales, qu'on soit pasteur, qu'on soit agriculteur, qu'on soit les hommes de forêt. Mais au-delà des, des, des dysfonctionnements et de ce qui existe au sein de, ces, de, 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 de cette zone. Nous sommes très préoccupés par cette forme de crise, effectivement, de sécurité au niveau du Sahel. Nous avons eu des approches déjà pour aider 
à se comprendre pour aller ensemble travailler et pour essayer de dépasser un certain nombre de, de, de sujets. Nous avons créé des dispositifs de, de collecte de données qui nous permettent d'avoir des productions paysannes de connaissances sur l'évolution non seulement de la crise, mais au-delà au sur l'évolution de la vie même de ces exploitations familiales au niveau de ce Sahel. C'est le rôle fondamental que nous sommes en train de jouer. C'est ce qui nous a amené d'ailleurs à se mobiliser d'une manière plus large pour agir ensemble. Je voudrais ici signifier, montrer comment nous avons pu partager cette expérience entre 12 réseaux sur la connaissance des exploitations familiales au niveau de cette zone. Particulièrement, au-delà de ça, c'est de donner des bonnes informations pour appuyer nos membres dans les différents projets. Et dans le cas spécifique de ce projet, nous, sommes, nous essayons d'apporter notre contribution, que ce soit au niveau des pays ou au niveau régional, en intégrant l'ensemble des comités, mais en veillant sur l'application des bonnes décisions qui ont été prises au sein de ces organisations. De ce point de vue, ça, ça, ça nous fait naître des attentes aux, au niveau des organisations régionales. Notre première attente, c'est que nous, on est né pour porter la voix de nos membres c'est d'être présent dans toutes les instances de décision. La deuxième attente, naturellement, c'est d'arriver à une orientation d'investissement qui permette effectivement de régler cette question fondamentale qui est une question de pauvreté. Ce qui se passe, du point de vue des organisations que nous avons, que nous sommes, nous l'avons analysé du point de vue de la pauvreté. C'est l'accentuation de la pauvreté, le désespoir des jeunes qui a amené effectivement à qu'on est arrivé à des situations pareilles. En quoi tout ce qui va être projet en ce que tout ce qui va être projeté ou parlé va dans le sens de résorber cette pauvreté. C'est dans ce, voilà la plus forte attente que nous avons des grandes institutions, politiquement intégration régionale en premier et leurs partenaires qui effectivement peuvent être en premier ces trois organisations avec qui nous partageons ce webinaire. Grosso modo, nous continuons à s'engager à apporter notre contribution dans le cadre de ce qui est en train de faire dans ce Sahel. Et en deuxièmement, effectivement, nous nous engageons à partir avec vous dans le cadre de ce projet. Je ne vais pas aller plus loin que ça. Je pourrais compléter mon intervention par des questions précises, mais laissez à même temps M. Blaman, que je salue, me compléter au cas où il y a eu des points que je n'ai pas pu aborder. Je vous remercie. Merci. Merci beaucoup, euh, Nadji Roussal. Et effectivement, ce sont des vues très importantes. Najirou, as you heard, is the Secretary General of the overall APEX organization in West Africa. So, Monsieur, um, est-ce que le collègue de l'élevage veut rajouter un mot ou pas? Blama, tu veux prendre la parole? So, on, on top of farm organization, you know that there are livestock the organization which are very important and uh, they also participating to the program okay i think it's now time is running yeah? so i want to keep with the timeline and we are now moved to the implementation of a program so for this uh, i will call uh, all the implementers in the field starting with niger and maybe uh, mr idrissa from uh, wfp Because in Niger, there is a longer experience of uh, people working together. So, Mr. Idrissa, the floor is yours. Monsieur Idrissa, au Niger, vous pouvez prendre la parole. Merci. Bonjour uh, à toutes et à tous. Uh, donc, uh, merci uh, aussi pour cet honneur pour le Niger. Uh, comme vous le savez, depuis 2017, les trois agences travaillent sur un programme conjoint pluriannuel de renforcement de, de la résilience dans, dans deux régions du Niger. À travers cette initiative conjointe, les agences ont pu contribuer à renforcer à la résilience des ménages face à l'insécurité alimentaire et nutritionnelle, surtout que c est, c est, ce sont des zones qui étaient les plus touchées par des, des crises pour l'Orlanger. Donc, le principe de mise en œuvre de ces, de ces programmes conjoints était basé d'abord sur une planification conjointe avec un cadre de coordination opérationnelle à tous les niveaux, puis euh, une, pro, une planification conjointe basée sur les outils de planification communautaire participative du PAM, puis euh, le ciblage conjoint des ménages très pauvres et pauvres 
où euh, l'ensemble de ces ménages sont considérés comme les ménages bénéficiaires de l'ensemble des agences. Et aussi la mise en œuvre d'un paquet intégré, et pluriannuel et multisectoriel. Et enfin aussi, il y a tout ce qui est le système de suivi et évaluation conjoint et des documentations de bonnes pratiques que nous avons mis en place. Donc, grâce à, à, à la mise en œuvre de ces programmes conjoints, on a les résultats ont montré que, en unissant leurs forces, les agences ont pu augmenter la production agro sur le niveau pastoral des, des communautés. Les, les communautés, euh, surtout euh, les jeunes, ne migrent, migrent moins dans ces zones. Il y a eu aussi l'amélioration ou la diversification des, des, des moyens d'existence de, de ces communautés dans ces zones. Et aussi, euh, il y a eu plus d'emplois et de revenus pour les jeunes et qui a contribué euh, au renforcement de la cohésion sociale, mais aussi à l'autonomisation des femmes et, et, et des jeunes. Et basé aussi sur cette expérience du Niger, une stratégie conjointe a été développée par les trois agences et les priorités de cette stratégie étaient d'abord en la mise à l'échec de, 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 de la collaboration conjointe avec d'autres zones conformes à ce projet Initiative Résilience, puis mettre en place un certain nombre de documents commun, notamment la stratégie de gestion des connaissances, des mobilisations des ressources, mais aussi des communications au niveau, au niveau des pays. Donc, le projet SD3C euh, s'inscrit dans cette même logique où euh, c'est un pas vers la mise à l'échelle de cette expérience et qu'on euh, va se concentrer euh, au niveau du PAM sur la fourniture du paquet intégré euh, aux ménages vulnérables à travers que ce soit des activités de création d'actifs productif, le soutien aux adolescentes, le soutien à la nutrition spécifique et, 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 et sensible. Le, le PAM et la FAO, le, le, le FIDA et la FAO vont pouvoir contribuer aussi à l'intégration économique régionale, mais aussi le renforcement de tout ce qui est des organisations de producteurs en s'assurant vraiment qu'il y ait une bonne amélioration de la gouvernance communautaire des ressources naturelles permettant aussi aux petits producteurs agricoles de s'adapter face aux crises et catastrophes éventuelles. Donc, euh, en gros, si toutes ces actions sont bien planifiées, sont bien séquencées, alors nous pensons que euh, ce projet pourra aussi contribuer à obtenir des meilleurs résultats pour les communautés. Voilà euh, ce que je voulais dire par rapport à l'expérience du Niger. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, euh, Monsieur Idrissa, du point de vue du PAM au Niger. Thank you very much for this intervention. Now we are going deeper and deeper into the implementation, and we will call upon two uh, project coordinators in the field. So they are the ones always in their car, you know, going in the communities, talking, discussing with them and their teams. So first, I'd like to ask Mr. Boubacar Altin, who is a coordinator in Niger, if he can give us an update of what has been achieved in the field since the start of SD3C, the regional program. Bienvenue, Monsieur Altin. Et Merci, Monsieur Benoît. À vous. Par rapport à Niger, ce qui a été fait depuis le lancement du programme. Euh, je vais dire de façon pratique, en 2021, sur trois mois de mise en œuvre effective euh, des activités du projet, nous avons pu, euh, en tout cas, livrer aux communautés un certain nombre de paquets de résilience euh, qui ont trait, en tout cas, à, à trois grands domaines euh, de paquets. Le premier paquet, c'est effectivement de l'amélioration des actifs agro-pastoral et halieutique. Euh, Idrissa a parlé dans ce sens-là. Et là, on a pu, en tout cas, appuyer les communautés à récupérer des terres dégradées, à fixer des dunes sur environ euh, 300 hectares et à aussi bénéficier en termes de cash transfert d'environ euh, 37 000 euh, francs CFA pour les 2770 ménages qui ont été touchés par ces activités. Ces activités, de façon globale, ont permis de mettre à la disposition de ces communautés environ 103 millions de francs CFA. 103 millions de francs CFA, c'est à peu près 15% du financement du plan de travail annuel de 2021. 
Donc, c'est environ 15% du plan de travail 2021 qui a été mis à la disposition directement de, à, à, à la disposition de ces communautés-là pour renforcer euh, leur résilience. Le deuxième paquet d'activités qu'on a eu à faire, c'est de créer les conditions pour que la paix sociale s'installe, pour que les communautés se parlent davantage. Donc, dans ce cadre-là, on a mis en place 90 clubs Timtria qui sont des cadres d'échange et de formation des jeunes pour qu'ils soient des acteurs de développement, des acteurs de la paix et qu'ils puissent aussi bénéficier des opportunités de financement offertes par le projet, mais aussi d'autres projets. Le troisième paquet de résilience, c'est tout ce qui concerne les marchés. Donc, on a commencé à travailler, à réhabiliter le marché à bétail de Njidimi, dans la région de Tifa, à créer, à mettre en place, en tout cas, quatre centres de collecte de poissons, toujours au niveau de Tifa, mais à travailler aussi au niveau euh, de la région de Tilabéry pour pouvoir, en tout cas, cerner euh, les échanges, les flux entre les zones de production, les marchés, mais aussi les pays voisins donc les, les pays frontaliers, donc les pays de, de, de la zone des, des trois frontières. Et donc tout ce travail-là a été fait grâce à la mobilisation de trois agences, mais aussi des producteurs, parce que vous avez entendu, le produit a parlé de deux domaines d'intérêt particuliers, résorber la pauvreté, mais également l'intégration régionale. Et ces activités rentrent eh, dans cette logique-là, donc ça a une forte synergie des agences, une forte mobilisation des organisations de producteurs qui nous ont permis, en tout cas, de réaliser ces activités qui sont en train de se poursuivre, en tout cas, durant cette année 2022 aussi. Donc, voilà, en termes de réalisation concrète, ce que je peux dire, M. Benoît, je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, M. Altine. Donc, très intéressant pour cette partie euh, du Niger. Now, I'm going to call on uh, Draman Sidibe, who also is a coordinator, but in Mali this time, a big country. And uh, Mr. Sidibe has been managing a finance program for many years and is now leading the SD3C implementation. So, um, Draman, can you tell us what are the activities uh, you're doing with Inclusive and SD3C? Merci, 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 Monsieur Benoît. Bonjour à tous. Uh, et spécialement, le... what are you doing on the insecurity problem? Go over to you. À toi, uh, Draman. Oui, euh, merci, euh, Monsieur Benoît. Euh, le programme SD3C a, a été aussi lancé au Mali il y a environ euh, cinq mois. Euh, déjà, nous avons euh, pu bâtir une euh, véritable dynamique euh, de collaboration entre les équipes, hein, les équipes de projets autres, la FAO, euh, le FIDA et, et, et les PAM. Donc, ce qui a permis euh, d'avoir un certain nombre de résultats sur cette période euh, de démarrage du projet. Euh, je pars sur le ciblage euh, dans les zones d'intervention du projet, mais surtout euh, l'acquisition des kits et d'intrants, euh, notamment euh, des kits euh, pastoraux et agricoles. Il s'agit de plus de 1000 kits euh, vétérinaires animaux, 1000 kits euh, avicoles, 3000 sacs euh, d'intrants euh, d'aliments bétail, disons, euh, des kits pour la lutte anti-Covid. Donc, ce sont déjà des acquis qui ont été euh, obtenus par le projet sur la période d'intervention. Mais ce qu'il faut retenir comme enseignement beaucoup sur cette période, c'est la dynamique de collaboration qui a permis d'engager de façon persuasive le ciblage. Je prends le cas du ciblage sur les activités de résilience. Les équipes inclusives FAO et PAM ont convenu d'une approche commune, combinant les stratégies de ciblage des trois structures, ce qui a permis de façon participative, inclusive, euh, sélectionner, euh, identifier euh, 37 communes, dont 27 au centre nord et 10 dans la région de Caï. Et concernant euh, le ciblage pour les activités d'intégration économique, euh, nous avons euh, pu mobiliser une équipe technique qui a sillonné euh, avec l'appui de la cellule régionale euh, du SD3C à Nouakchott, qui a sillonné les zones frontalières entre le Mali et le Sénégal et le Mali et la Mauritanie, et a vu la participation des équipes du Sénégal et des équipes également de la Mauritanie, ce qui a permis de façon participative 
euh, avec euh, l'appui des autorités locales, des producteurs dans ces différentes localités et de façon conjointe avec les équipes des différents pays euh, d'identifier euh, un certain nombre de communes cibles du projet déjà. Donc, cela a comme avantage euh, de faire en sorte que euh, euh, l'ingénierie sociale pour euh, l'identification des sites puisse être facilitée et faciliter également la mise en œuvre des activités d'intégration économique entre les populations transfrontalières euh, du projet. Donc, euh, il faut également noter euh, que cela permettra euh, de, de reçu les ciblages des bénéficiaires en harmonie avec euh, les pays du euh, le Sénégal et la Mauritanie, et aussi éviter une dispersion euh, d'activités euh, que nous avons euh, sur les stratégies axées sur les proximités des zones favorables et, la de la, et à la concentration. Et surtout, Surtout, ce qu'il faut noter, l'optimisation des interventions des différents pays. Donc, je pense que c'est des acquis que nous avons euh, déjà concernant le, le SD3C. Et ce que je veux dire par rapport à, à l'insécurité, le projet euh, HOT, qui est le projet euh, inclusif, euh, travaille sur deux démarches combinées euh, dans les zones d'insécurité pour pouvoir, euh, l'absence des services publics, pour pouvoir... Euh, délivrer, euh, le, le, continuer à travailler, continuer à accompagner les populations. D'abord, les ONG locales euh, qui sont euh, identifiées, qui sont issues des communautés, qui sont installées dans la communauté et qui travaillent avec le projet. Nous avons aussi la deuxième euh, démarche, c'est ce qu'on appelle les relais communautaires. Nous avons développé un vaste réseau national, plus de 400 relais aujourd'hui issus et identifiés parmi les populations qui sont la plupart des cas des nœuds alphabètes et qui sont encadrés, formés et sur l'approche d'intervention du projet et qui accompagne les interventions du projet en l'absence de services publics dans les zones d'insécurité. Donc, euh, ce qui est beaucoup aujourd'hui beaucoup plus euh, problématique, c'est la question d'accès aux services financiers dans les zones euh, d'insécurité. On peut faire euh, l'humanitaire, on peut faire euh, d'autres types d'activités, mais l'accès aux services financiers est beaucoup plus problématique. Et les institutions de microfinance qui sont aujourd'hui partenaires du projet, nous avons, opté, nous avons opté pour travailler avec ces institutions de microfinance qui sont beaucoup plus de la proximité, qui sont plus, la plupart des cas issus même de ces communautés. Nous avons eh, amené les institutions de microfinance à travailler avec ces relais communautaires et, et même à travailler avec les ONG qui sont là-bas, qui jouent le rôle d'intermédiaire pour pouvoir euh, délivrer en tout cas les services financiers. Donc, il continue dans certaines zones ou la plupart des zones d'insécurité aujourd'hui, même si l'institution physiquement n'est pas aujourd'hui euh, euh, présente. Et ce qu'il faut aussi noter, c'est que nous avons intensifié l'éducation financière, ce qui, notamment sur les aspects de gestion euh, des risques sécuritaires. Et surtout, nous avons expérimenté, c'est euh, un aspect très important, nous avons expérimenté l'utilisation de la téléphonie pour euh, la mise en place du crédit et le remboursement. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, euh, Draman Sidibé, pour ces explications en tant que chef de projet. Thank you very much. It's very clear that uh, you managed to continue the program activity despite the coup in Mali, despite the, difficulty, the difficult situation in uh, northern and central areas of Mali. And of course, the mobile banking is uh, helping a lot through the use of smartphone for many transactions. So now again on Mali, I will turn to Benoit Mazi is from WFP. And I'd like to ask you Benoit, what the WFP is doing with such insecurity and how you manage to keep the continuity of your activities. We heard from the communities earlier, the farm organization, then we heard from a project, and now we'd like to hear from you as a UN agency. Over to you, Benoit. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Benoit. Uh, hello, uh, everybody. I will complete uh, the, the intervention of my uh, colleague uh, Traman Sidibe uh, from uh, SD3C. Uh, so uh, for WFP and uh, FEO, because we, we, we work together uh, closely since a long time in the northern of Mali, 
uh, I will explain how we can, uh, how we implement our uh, activities uh, in this uh, uh, difficult working uh, areas. So, uh, fortunately, as UN humanitarian uh, agencies, we are well accepted by the population and armed group uh, are aware of that. And so we are a little bit uh, protected. More of that, we have regu regular contacts with uh, identified groups and we negotiate uh, the humanitarian access. Uh, especially for the, 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 the saving life uh, activities. Uh, however, there are a lot of unidentified un and uncontrolled people uh, and also minor truths and, uh, and so on, and that restrict a lot uh, our uh, staff uh, movement, especially uh, in the UN uh, context. So regarding this, uh, these difficulties, we based uh, our field operation on four pillars. First, the community participation. The intervention are based on an inclusive and participatory approach. This, make, uh, this makes communities more responsible for the smooth running of the program in the field. The second pillar is the local uh, governmental technical services. So if the public services or administration is sometimes failing in these uh, difficult uh, areas, we can uh, count on a, a good implica implication of the field uh, uh, from the technical uh, services. These people are uh, local people and stay uh, uh, in, the, in the communities and know their job. And so they are uh, still present in the field. So we, uh, we are working together with them and we have uh, some uh, contracts with the administration to, to, to work with these uh, technical services to uh, support uh, communities in the uh, assets and uh, infrastructures, uh, rehabilitation or construction. So the third uh, pillar is the cooperating partner. As uh, Draman said, uh, we contract uh, WFP and uh, FAO, uh, some uh, local uh, NGOs, uh, to uh, organize uh, communities and to uh, ensure the, 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 the good participation of the communities uh, in, the, in the activities. They are also responsible of uh, distribution of uh, cash by uh, mobile phone as we can, but you know that even uh, with, a, with mobile phone, we have problem uh, in the northern of Mali. Uh, but they are also um, responsible uh, for distributing uh, uh, equipment. So uh, to control all, all of this, we use also uh, a third party uh, monitoring partners. Uh, to regular to 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 to, to get uh, together a uh, report from the from the field on the progress uh, of the uh, of the intervention. So uh, these are the these well, are the, the, the four pillars. Thank you so much. Thank you very no. much, Benoit. Oh. I uh, will ask uh, Mr. Abdul to mute his phone, or maybe the administrator of a conference can do that. Now we are going towards the last 20 minutes of our discussion. And after having discussed about the Sahel program, we will move more to the climate change <clears throat> aspects. About uh, climate change, uh, we have this uh, issue of climate financing 
And the climate financing is getting now more and more important. So I will only give three minutes to each of you, Adam, Thomas, and Pate, so you can tell us about what will be do, what will happen on uh, climate change activities, mitigation activities. That's for Ada. How will you finance it? That's for Thomas. And how will the Great Green Wall Initiative will evolve in the future? That's for the Pate. So over to you for three minutes each. Ada, please. So, uh, thank you so much, uh, Benoit. I think uh, the climate change issues is a really big problem in Israel. And I think to address this is necessary to ensure that uh, food security benefits from important investments and action to adapt agriculture, forestry, and fishery to the challenge that this pose. And I think uh, this requires concrete action in priority area that can include the production of evidence and knowledge for forecasting, uh, anticipation, and improve climate risk management. That is really important. And also the, the data and knowledge forecasting can improve in parts of assessment and adaptation. That is also important. The another thing is the conservation of sustainable and management of biodiversity. And CDB uh, just said that it's important to improve the financial platform <coughs> at, uh, and financial services at community level. And as you know, uh, within this program, SD3C, FAO have already uh, established some uh, uh, village saving and loan association. And uh, I think this can be used to uh, involve the commercial uh, banks and to ensure uh, 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 the, the climate uh, the, or financial services to uh, farmers' organization. Another thing, and uh, not uh, the, 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 the least, is the development of innovative and climate resilient technology to, to, to strengthen the resilience of COVID value share. And as you know, in recent years, FAO has uh, taken several promising uh, uh, initiatives uh, that can be scaled up uh, to strengthen the resilience of silent population to climate change. And then I want just to list here two, two very important uh, initiatives that can be scaling up and technology uh, that can be scaling up. The first one is the one million system, system uh, for the SIL uh, initiative, which as you know, is one of FAO flagship technology for the mobilization and efficient use of water in household and for agriculture. The initiative, as you know, aims to promote and to facilitate uh, the establishment of rainwater harvesting and storage shell for vulnerable community. The another one is uh, the project that we lead here in Senegal in the framework, uh, in the framework of uh, Great Green Wall uh, uh, Initiative. The project is called the Resilience and Intensive Reforestation for the Surveillance of the Continental and Cow System in Senegal. And this project is funded with uh, 6.2 million euros and implemented by, by our uh, office here in Senegal. So this project aims to put in place a holistic and integrated governance system for natural resources and also to boost the restoration and rehabilitation of agro system and promote a contributing and to carbon sequestration and to improve the cow system services. That is really important. And another aspect of the project is to strengthen the capacity of the population, including the vulnerable group, by creating a kind of sustainable opportunity for the valorization and development of non-timber forest border value chain, and by promoting public private in partnership. So that's what I want to share with you and over to you, Benoit. Thank you very much uh, for FAO. And I pass the floor to WFP. Thanks a lot. Um, I, 
the cost of mobilizing a humanitarian response can be actually greatly reduced when anticipatory action and early response systems are in place for, prior to a failed harvest, for instance. Um, some WFP return on investment study uh, indicates that for one dollar invested in anticipatory action, we can avoid three dollars in humanitarian response costs. Based on this proved evidence, WFP has put in place three financing mechanisms for climate risk financing already implemented according to the context in West Africa. Forecast-based financing supports countries to mitigate and manage predictable climate-related risks by linking extreme weather forecasts with anticipatory action before natural hazards materialize. WFP is currently implementing said forecast-based financing in Niger. Micro or inclusive insurances protect low-income people excluded from traditional financial services in exchange for regular premium payments. In the G5 Sahel and mostly in Niger and Burkina Faso, WFP has during the 2020-2021 agricultural campaign allowed nearly 180,000 farming households to access index insurance and a range of complementary risk management services benefiting approximately 900,000 people. Macro insurances cover a national country to protect the entire population, such as the sovereign insurance project offered by the African Risk Capacity Limited. This year in Mali, a payout of $10 million is enabling a support to 200,000 beneficiaries over three months ahead of the lean season, including with unconditional cash transfer, asset creation activities, and nutritional assistance for children, pregnant and lactating women. Art Replica is also implemented by WFP in Burkina Faso and Mauritania. IFAD and various partners are also combating climate change by giving small-scale producers access to the zero-interest financing they often lack, but also by promoting the implementation of climate insurance, as we mentioned earlier. Last, African government can also issue green bonds with the support of development banks and the expertise of UN agencies in order to raise finance for climate change solutions, for example, mitigation or adaptation related projects. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for this, uh, Thomas. And um, now we pass on to Ifad and Pate. <clears throat> Mr. Sen, uh, it's been a long time now that uh, the Great Green Wall was launched, almost 20 years. What was not working then? And what is this accelerator now that everybody is speaking about for the last year? Over to you. Thank you very much, Benoit. And, and, and let me start by saying it's not just a wall but it's a great and green inspirational vision, which has been evolving over almost the, to, the next, last 20 to 10. It has started since 2007 and, and, and a vision of African leaders. So over the last past years, it has shifted from planting trees across the Sahel to a comprehensive and integrated development approach which address drought, climate change, poverty, migration, and security, and so on. Now, within a COVID, where we are talking about building back better. So all those new aspects has been integrated in the new thinking to give momentum. In between, a lot of assessment and also evaluation have been done for the Green Greek Wall with the World Bank, which has injected $1.2 billion over the last past years. And the key lesson learned was more successful technical perspective from, from land management, sustainable land practices, and so on. But where we have issues, it's really on coordination. So there is donor fragmentation, several, several projects, weak environmental governance. You have also the limited coordination and knowledge management to inform new project and obviously unstructured monitoring and evaluation system. So the access of finance is key and it has been particular bottlenecks for all those who are in the green grid world area, particularly from the private, uh, the private sector. Now, what to do? What to do is uh, since the last year, there have been a lot of discussion with world leaders and in Paris, or during the One Planet Summit in January, 
So the Green Grid World Accelerator to bring in many partners, many organizations from MDBs, UN and uh, IFAD to come and join, join hands with the countries to deal and accelerate the implementation of this vision. It starts by investment in small size farms and strengthening the value chain. It is also sustainable management of ecosystem and land restoration, climate resilient infrastructure, as well as energy uh, and uh, create the enabling environment uh, to bring $14 billion that was pledged. So in this $14 billion, we've been also working in IFAD to mobilize that share from the Green Climate Fund with the Integrated Climate Risk Management I mentioned earlier, which combine adaptation, risk to preparedness and insurance, micro and micro, and uh, the inclusive green finance, which is a mechanism to provide green financing to smallholder farmers at 0% interest rate, so they can work on sustainable uh, agriculture and inclusive agriculture in that area, including also the entire value chain and energy uh, plug into those value chain. It goes also from GEF project, which we have, and their integrated program, uh, which cover 12 countries, including some countries in the Sahel with FAO, UNIDO, and UNDP, uh, and also our big program on adaptation for smallholder agriculture program, which many projects are being implementing through our program of loans and grants. And lastly, so our program of loans and grants, which uh, Bonua and other country directors have portfolios at the country level, but IVAD has committed that more than 40% of our investment will be climate focused to address these interconnected uh, but also complex issues that uh, you know uh, sub, uh, create issues on, on, on the production. So to implement this, we have our decentralization 2.0 with all this hub and the hub of Benoit is coordinating this. And most of these projects we are bringing in have also technical people uh, integrated and they will be sitting in Dakar with the hub to support the implementation and also technical guidance on adaptation, which today for any dollars, $18 invested in adaptation, we only have, on, on mitigation, sorry, we only have $1 for adaptation. And the region need to adapt and make this green grid world work for all, for inclusive, prosperous, and uh, stable society. Over. Thank you very much, uh, Pate. I hope you can hear the music we are having in Dubai. Very nice group outside. And uh, here we are slowly coming to the end of our discussion. Uh, it's good to hear you, Pate, because the Great Green Wall is really going to make a change on the Sahel. It requires countries to work together and I really hope that first we had this SD3C program, which is now expanding to more countries, but we will have also the Great Green Wall, uh, who will slowly expand uh, more and more activities. Something I like to add is that uh, governments need support in all the Sahel countries, we can say. May few people know that these governments have almost no means to work. If I compare with some of the countries in Asia, you can see a country like Cambodia, where Ministry of Agriculture is 20,000 people. If you compare the same in Niger, Burkina, Mali, there is probably 2,000 people, whereas the population is two times, three times bigger. So this is an issue which I think should be taken into account into the programs for Sahel. The other aspect, as we all know, is Sahel is growing a lot in population. Now we are talking about 300 million people, but in 30 years time, that would be double, up to 600 million people. So the question to government is how to feed all these people Will we import the food? Will we produce it locally? How can the Great Green Wall help in order to produce more food and indeed help the development in the countries? So I would like to thank you all for having participating. I see uh, about 60 people on Zoom, many people on YouTube and Facebook. 
Maybe we will take five, take five, six minutes to see if there are questions from the floor. In that case, please uh, raise, your, raise your hand and then we will move to the final video uh, at the end of the questions. So the floor is open. Uh, you can also write your question in the chat. That's a possibility. And raise your hands as well. Maybe if uh, Blama is still uh, in line, Blama, si vous êtes toujours là, est-ce que vous pourriez nous faire une intervention de la, du point de vue des éleveurs et oui, des problèmes je suis, qui les je suis là, je suis là, je suis là. Voilà, donc dites-nous un peu du point de vue des populations pastoralistes, comment elles sont affectées par la crise du Sahel et quelles solutions sont en place. Je vous passe la parole. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Benoît. Et je pense que je m'alignais avec ce que notre administrateur, Monsieur Najirussal, a bien souligné. Et ce qu'il faut souligner de façon globale, c'est que les organisations ont l'accès aux zones d'insécurité. Et ce sont d'insécurité aujourd'hui, je pense que les organisations de producteurs, compte tenu de leur présence sur le terrain, leur acceptance communautaire joue un rôle important pour seconder les services techniques et également les, les agences des Nations Unies. Le second élément sur lequel nous avons beaucoup travaillé, c'est beaucoup plus compliqué pour avoir un ciblage qui soit le plus consensuel dans la mise en œuvre également et du PSD. Et un dernier point qu'on remarquera très bien, c'est que dans les composantes du SD3C, aucunement il y a une composante spéciale sur la cohésion sociale. Donc les organisations de producteurs peuvent jouer un rôle assez important. Et pour ce qui concerne les communautés pastorales, il y a une conjugaison à la fois. Et une crise humanitaire, un développement, une crise d'intégration sociétale. Une crise humanitaire liée au choc climatique, mais surtout également à l'institution qui est de plus en plus dans ces zones, qui les vulnérabilise économiquement et met en péril également les stratégies. Il y a, et sur ce point essentiel, on peut pour le volet de la mobilité qui est le vol de détail. Et surtout, cette question d'insécurité. Quand on prend également de façon récente, quand on prend ici aujourd'hui, il y a eh, plus ou moins des populations et des éleveurs qu'on a demandé de quitter. Tessit, c'est au Mali. Nous avons l'information depuis hier que l'essentiel des éleveurs se retrouve au niveau de Tessit Village. Et qu'est-ce que ça a entraîné L'augmentation du prix des sacs et de riz. De 50 kilos qui se vendait à 25 000 se vend aujourd'hui à 35 000. Et à plus de ça, vous avez également le prix d'un mouton, qui était pratiquement à 40 000, qui se vend aujourd'hui à 10 000. Donc, il y a une détérioration des termes de l'échange en, en, en défaveur de l'éleveur, en plus des autres formes d'insécurité liées au vol du bétail et liées à l'insécurité physique également. Quant à la question de la crise sociétale, c'est beaucoup plus la remise en cause aujourd'hui de la mobilité, la remise en cause également des politiques qui étaient favorables à la, à la, à la mobilité, notamment dans certains pays, qui créent aujourd'hui, aujourd je dirais, cette psychose et cette ethnisation un peu plus forte au niveau qu'on a au niveau des communautés pastorales. Donc, le vivre ensemble est plus ou moins remis en question. Donc, tout ce que nous sommes en train de faire aujourd'hui, et grâce à l'appui du SD3C, c'est beaucoup plus une étude sur qu'est-ce que c'est que l'insécurité vue sous le regard éleveur. Et ça, et le SD3C nous a accompagnés et beaucoup plus à avoir une restitution de mobiliser les autorités politiques au plus haut niveau, et en plus de travailler beaucoup plus sur la vulnérabilité pastorale vue également sous l'angle des pasteurs. Le dernier point que je voulais souligner, et M. Benoît, c'est qu'il faut qu'on change également notre approche et notre paradigme. On construisait également l'appui et l'assistance, je dirais, humanitaire sur le calendrier agricole. Donc, on mettait l'essentiel des appuis sur une période de trois mois qu'on appelle période de soudure avec la conjugaison des facteurs sécuritaires et des facteurs à la fois humanitaires et ce que je viens de souligner sur le plan social, cette période de sidu ne doit plus être vue sous l'angle seulement du calendrier agricole. Elle est plus ou moins devenue une forme structurelle d'une anomalie. Comment est-ce que ces agents des Nations Unies Monsieur Biama, vous êtes en mute. 
Merci de vous, de vous mettre en... qu'on puisse vous entendre à nouveau. OK. Et j'espère que vous m'entendez Oui, maintenant parfaitement. Merci. Oui, on va Et vous demander le, de raccourcir pour passer à le la, dernier, dernière les, la dernière phrase, M. Benoît, c'est de dire que que ce soit l'appellation qu'on le donnait, le type Nexus ou également la combinaison de l'urgence développement, il faut valoriser quelques principes. La flexibilité, la valeur ajoutée des acteurs dans les interventions, la localisation des interventions et avoir une approche qui soit très sensible au conflit et au contexte. Et je m'arrêterai là et vous remercie beaucoup pour cette opportunité que nous avons eue pour intervenir. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Blama. Thank you very much. So we are going now to the last question, which I will ask uh, Rama to answer. It is often said that a crisis is also an opportunity. So among the many crises of Sahel, climate, economy, security, social, political, what are the opportunities you see we could size in this crisis so to help Sahel in its development? Over to you, Rama. Thank you. Benoit, thank you so much to, to give me the floor now for this, uh, for this question to focus on the opportunities on, uh, on the Sahel, because we know, of course, that uh, the Sahel is facing many challenges that uh, everyone uh, knows, and uh, it's very important to have the change on narrative. And it's why that within the UNIS, the integrated, the UN integrated strategy for the Sahel, uh, we have tried to focus, you know, on the opportunities to support the countries uh, to, uh, to tackle all the challenges. And uh, I would like only uh, to, to make two points. Then one point is on UNIS, that we have uh, six priorities on UNIS in the UN support plan. And, um, you know, to, uh, to, to, to propose some inform integrated uh, intervention regarding the first priority is the cross-border cooperation. The second one is the prevention and sustaining peace. The third one is on inclusive growth and access to social uh, basic services. The fourth one is the climate action, then building resilience uh, uh, to, uh, to food security. The fifth one is renewable energy. And the last one are, uh, is women and youth empowerment. I would like to focus on the two last priorities because I think the two, these two priorities of the UN support plan of the strategy, the UN integrated strategy for the Sahel, covering 10 countries, um, it's very important. Then the, the first one is the opportunity on youth people because we know that Sahel is one of the world's youth pool region. Uh, with 64%, almost 65% of the population uh, being below 25 years, the Sahel is one of the world's most youthful regions. Therefore, the investment in education and vocational training could yield huge demographic dividends. And the Sahel population can benefit from the demographic dividend if they are well educated and if both girls and boys are given access to job creation opportunities, then the economic or social tar target can be achieved taking, uh, taking human capital into account. Then that's very important. And the second, the other and last point, it's uh, regarding the renewable energy, uh, regarding most of all water and sun, uh, because we know that the Sahel uh, is also ended with uh, enormous renewable energy potential. It has more solar energy production capacity than all the regions of the world. And we have lots of opportunities to develop in this, uh, in this, uh, in this line. And of course, also regarding the water that we have surface and groundwater, lots of reserves of surface and groundwaters 
that could be, uh, a, uh, you know, um, exploited perhaps in a in a better sustainable way, but uh, which are very which are uh, now uh, available for that. And uh, our colleagues uh, before mentioned about the Great Green Wall, then we have all this opportunity, this uh, uh, enormous initiative, uh, you know, uh, um, over uh, 11 countries that we have all to be uh, really uh, partnering uh, around it uh, to be able to reforest, uh, to, re to greening, to green the Sahel and to involve, of course, the most vulnerable categories of the population, young people and women. Then I think I will uh, let the discussion here and uh, thank you very much for all the participation. Thank you very much, Rama, and I think these opportunities uh, can help us to close the event. So before we can see the last uh, short video, concluding it, I'd like to thank again all the participants to the panel, whether you are from farm organization, whether you are from projects or from the various institutions. i like to thank as well uh, Dr. Assa for her introduction in the events and all our colleagues here in the UN hub in Dubai who really help us for the logistic aspect of the event. And of course, thanks all of you in Dakar who have helped to stream the events and show the translation. I think it was good, no? We all spoke English, even the Francophone, the French speaker. So that was nice. And uh, I hope we can see the video. Is it up uh, now? It's from which screen are we going to see it? I will share my screen, uh, Benoit. Then uh, you tell me when I can begin to, uh, you know, to, to put okay. the video on. So thank you very much to all of you. And uh, we see you again. Please visit Sahel and let's establish some linkage as well between Middle East region and the Sahel region. We can start the video and thank you very much. Long as you can't